newscasts these days, and sometimes you get, you're told the following images are going to be disturbing so, for some of our audience. So um, those who might find these images disturbing, um, this is a forewarning. I'm going to make that warning to you now. Because I'm going to talk about justice denied, which is a very simple concept, but it has grave implications for the world that we live in. I want you to start imagining with me just a small experiment to begin with. Um, you imagine that you are in your community where you live today, and you go home to your apartment or your house, and you find that it has been broken into. You're understandably outraged, and you call the police. What do you expect will happen? Anyone? They'll come. The police will come. Somebody will send someone to investigate what's happened. But let's change the location to somewhere else in the world. A community maybe far away. A group of armed men go through this community. They separate the men and the boys from the women and the girls. They kill all the men and all the boys above the age of 12. They line them up and they execute them. The women and the girls are also separated. The young virgins are set aside to be sold or traded into sexual slavery. Some of the women are raped. Others are given to the fighters to be used for later. Now, in this situation, when the survivors call for help, what do you expect will happen? I'm not asking you what you think should happen, and I'm not asking you what you hope to happen. What do you realistically think will happen? Anyone? Thank you. Tragically, that is exactly what most of us do. Most of us have a much lower expectation for a response to a mass atrocity than we do for a simple economic crime in our own backyard. And this is justice denied. When we do not even expect a response to victims of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, what we're actually doing is allowing for cycles of violence throughout the world to continue. The World Bank in 2011 had a report that said that in the first part of this century, about 90% of conflicts are reoccurring conflicts. Just think about that. That's 90%. And we know that one of the reasons why conflicts reoccur is because there has not been justice for previous wrongs. We also know that just holding some of those responsible to account will help give a sense of justice. Even giving a chance to victims and survivors to speak, to tell their stories, to have the truth come out, helps. So why is it so difficult to hold to account people who kill men, women, and children, who turn children into killers and sex slaves, who use rape as a tool of war and an instrument of torture. After all, we have, in this last 20 or 22 years, um, provided a lot of attention, paid a lot of attention to international justice. Personal responsibility for mass atrocity crimes, that was begun in Nuremberg and Tokyo, was, in fact, frozen during the Cold War. But with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Rwanda genocide, the crimes committed in former Yugoslavia, in Sierra Leone, and in other places, institutions were created with the power to investigate and find those guilty who perpetrated these crimes. And then we had the International Criminal Court. This court was set up to respond to situations where states were either unwilling or unable to investigate and prosecute themselves. In, since, ni since 1993, approximately $6.5 billion have been spent on international justice institutions. So what's the issue? Why has there been an increase in conflict-related crimes every year since 2007? Well, Let's start with the fact that the numbers, the, the amount of money spent on international justice institutions, may seem like a lot. 
But just compare that to the purported $51 billion spent on the Sochi Winter Olympic Games. Yet I don't want you to think that this is a numbers issue. This is not about how much money. It's about where and how the money is spent. And I also don't want to belittle the progress that we've made so far, because quite honestly, in one generation, we have actually created a sense of hope that international justice is going to prevail. But the continuing cycles of violence tell us, tells us that that sense of hope has not yet reached the turning point, the tipping point where it becomes realistic expectation, where the victims and survivors of conflict-related violence can trust in the law and not the gun for justice, and where those who are willing to pick up a gun stop because there are real consequences to breaking international law. And we have to get to that tipping point quickly, because if we do not, then these unfulfilled promises are going to grow into disappointment and resentment. And instead of helping, we're going to give another reason for those who have been violated to, to turn away from the law and into the arms of violence. Now, perhaps it is because I'm a child of Holocaust survivors that I, I have taken such an interest in international justice. It was during the time that I was working on the, the Sierra Leone Special Court and the International Criminal Court that I started to think about how to make sure that justice works in practice the same way it's supposed to work on paper. And one way to make sure that it works in practice, one way in which we can bridge hope into realistic expectation is to make sure that we improve the investigation of international crimes. As my previous speaker said, this is not, this is not rocket science. You have to get the investigation right in order to get justice right. If you get the investigation right, then all things that flow from there are possible and you can get credible accountability. Credible accountability is important because the people who are affected have to believe that the information on which prosecutors, judges, um, commissioners base their decisions is appropriately, um, promptly, professionally gathered, recorded, and reported. I don't want you to think about the investigation of international crimes, mass atrocities, like something you would think about in CSI International on television. It's not glamorous. It's very difficult and very dangerous work. It's often done in situations where there is an ongoing armed conflict. It's done by people who have to work without the tools and the resources they usually have back home. It's done in many places through interpreters. Always, these investigators have to protect the information, the sources of information, and themselves from those who do not want to see the investigation succeed. In a word, it's very, very hard to investigate international crimes. It's very hard because psychologically, after seeing those images and working in those areas, there's a psychological price that the investigators have to pay. And precisely because this work is so difficult, we have to make sure that those doing the work are appropriate. Now, appropriate doesn't just mean being qualified or experienced. It starts with being qualified and experienced. Um, qualifications like crime scene investigators, a whole range of forensic scientists and experts, sexual and gender-based violence investigators, witness protection people, to name just some of the most obvious. But appropriate also includes training, training in international human rights and criminal justice frameworks, and training how to be a safe and productive member of diverse international investigation teams. Appropriate further means having the cultural, legal, linguistic, and yes, even sometimes the religious affinity of the investigator to the people and the place where the investigation is taking place. 
having only people from the global north helping people from the global south has not really worked for us in the past. And finally, appropriate means timeliness. There are political and security windows of opportunity in which investigations are possible. If these are missed, the information and the evidence will erode. So will the trust of the people involved. Now, we have learned also what happens when there are not appropriate investigations. If, the, if you don't have the right person going to the right place at the right time, what this means, what usually happens, is there's a vacuum. And the vacuum is either not filled, or it's filled by those who have no jurisdiction and have no or very little training. And in those situations, what happens? The result is you have mishandled evidence, you have traumatized victims and, and interviewees, you have promises that are made to people that cannot possibly be kept, and probably most troubling of all, there's not enough attention paid to the do no more harm principle, which means that those who are already victims should not be exposed to greater danger just because there is an, ex uh, an examination and an investigation. Imagine with me another situation. A group of armed men go through the community where you now live. You're not home, but when you hear about it, you rush home. And instead of a simple break-in, you find the dead body of your son on the living room floor. Your daughter is curled up in the corner, having been repeatedly raped and left for dead. Your spouse is missing. You call for help, but the police have run away. You don't dare go outside because the perpetrators may still be around, so you have to eat, sleep, live in the same house where all this happened. And in a few days when the police do come back, they're actually not much help because they've never been trained to deal with situations of this scale. As time goes by, not very much happens because there has not been a real investigation, even though it's common knowledge who the perpetrators are. This is the definition of justice denied. In this situation, the lesson that the perpetrators learn is not one of deterrence. And what lesson do you learn from this? Are you not even just a little bit tempted to pick up a gun and take justice into your own hands? Okay, I know this is very depressing, and I do have some good news for you. The good news is that there is a beginning in the international community, a beginning of the understanding that we have to improve the investigation of international crimes so that we can have credible accountability. Now, the challenges are that states coming out of conflict seldom have the resources or the infrastructure to, have, to be able to carry out appropriate investigations. And the resources and the expertise that are needed to support these states are scattered throughout the international community. So what we've had to do is break down the traditional silos that exist in the international community where states do just this and international institutions do that, and civil society does something else. And we've had to bridge those silos and bring together under one roof the recruitment, the training, the certification, and the ability to deploy rapidly the expertise from all over the world, from all of these institutions and states and civil society organizations to assist in investigations anywhere. And the result? And the result is that we are now capable of having a prompt expert investigation of these crimes virtually anywhere in the world. It's, it's already, it's a reality, it's happening. And let me give you one small example of this. My own organization has been around for only five years, yet we have built uh, uh, a network of more than 100 um, entities, almost 80 of them states, and through training courses, we've already built a roster of more than 500 experts from 60 professional categories. These 500 experts come from 95 different countries, 
40% from the global south, and 52% of them are women. And we have already assisted in the investigation of more than 50 um, uh, crimes in every part of the world. Now, we're just starting and we have huge potential. But what I want to tell you is that there is something even more important, that we are setting a standard, and that standard is how investigation of mass atrocity crimes needs to be. What is the appropriate means to investigate mass atrocity crimes? By appropriate, I mean the quality, the expertise, the training, the diversity, and the rapid deployability of experts to make sure that the right people can be in the right place at the right time. If this standard can be employed anywhere in the world, then we will truly hit the new horizons that we're talking about today. And let me give you, let's imagine together another example that where, where this may be uh, possible. Imagine again with me that a group of armed men go through your community, the one where you live today. You're not there, but when you hear about it, you rush home. And instead of a simple burglary, you find the dead body of your son on the living room floor. Your daughter is curled up in the corner, having been repeatedly raped and left for dead. Your spouse is missing. You call for help. But this time, Help arrives in the form of appropriate investigators. No, they are not going to be able to bring back your son, and they're not going to be able to make your daughter whole immediately. But they do know how to speak to a traumatized witness. They know how to secure a crime scene like this. They know how to collect and preserve evidence relating to an atrocity crime. More importantly than that, they know how to make sure that their investigation does not bring you and your daughter more harm. And through the information that's collected, a real chance exists to bring the perpetrators of this crime to justice. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is going to right your wrongs, but if you're going to be honest with yourself, in this situation, are you more or less likely to pick up a gun and take the law into your own hands. The parent coming home and finding not just a simple burglary, but an atrocity may not be you. But it happens to people like you every day in many parts of the world. And before you think that this only happens in places that are far away, I just want to give you one word to think about, Ukraine. Change is necessary, and change for this means holding accountable our leaders who, for the last two decades, have been telling us that the international community will not tolerate impunity for the worst crimes known to humanity. And in order to hold our leaders accountable, the first thing that must happen is you have to expect that there will be an appropriate investigation of these crimes wherever they occur. And I'm here to tell you that change is very possible. Five years ago, an investigation like this would not necessarily have a strong sexual and gender-based violence component. But because over the years we have built up a very strong expert pool of sexual and gender-based violence investigators, an investigation today that did not have a strong sexual and gender-based violence focus would not be considered, considered serious or professional. This is what we can achieve together when we don't settle for the status quo. I want to be able to ima imagine a world where fewer conflicts recur a world where the victims and the survivors of, of uh, mass atrocities are able to trust in the law for their justice, and where would-be perpetrators think twice before they act, because they know that they're going to be effectively investigated. I want to think about a world where justice denied can be turned into justice achieved.
Thank you.